what are the best settings for this monitor. And by best settings, I mean the settings which worked for me, they worked on my unit, and according to the colorimeter targets which I typically go for in reviews. Each individual unit differs and everyone is going to have their own preferences. When you first turn the monitor on and try to change some things, it should ask you if you want to set it to standard mode rather than power saving mode. You do. If you have it set to power saving mode, it greatly restricts your settings. So you can see a lot of the menus greyed out. I set brightness to 60 and that got around my usual 160 nit target. But of course the brightness will depend on your own preferences and also your lighting environment. This is also with uniform brightness enabled. If you disable that, then it can go potentially brighter as explored in the review, but you have less stability. So it's gonna dim when there is more bright content on the screen. If you have uniform brightness enabled, the fluctuation is very slight. So it's just a more consistent experience, which I much prefer for SDR. There are also some game visual presets. I prefer using racing mode or you could use user. They're the same if you set them up in the same way. Most of the other settings make other adjustments. So scenery mode's just super saturated and it looks really funky. Cinema mode is kind of the same but looks a bit dimmer. And perhaps the gamma's a bit higher. RTS RPG again looks funky for different reasons. It's oversaturated and the gamma looks pretty high. FPS mode, it retains that strange oversaturated look. And when I say oversaturated, it actually crushes shades together all of this. You lose shade variety. This monitor has a good level of saturation out of the box using its native gamut, you really shouldn't want to have this extra boost in saturation. But if you do, perhaps for competitive reasons, it can make for a sort of simpler visual environment, perhaps, then you can actually adjust that manually, which I'll come on to later. Then you might like these settings, or you can adjust the saturation slider yourself. And note this oversaturation in some of the presets is with the saturation slider set to its correct neutral position of 50. So you can't overcome this extra saturation. It's a separate filter which you can't control. So yes, FPS mode also reduces the gamma, sets that to 2.0. You could reduce it further if you want to lift out dark details even more. There's sRGB cal mode. That's one of the sRGB emulation settings. I explore this in the review. And as I mentioned, it is more restrictive than the other one. So you can see the colour menu is greyed out. You can't set contrast if you happen to want to change that, and you can't control uniform brightness, which is forcefully enabled. And actually on my unit, the alternative mode, which would be to set this to something like user, change display colour space to sRGB. So that achieves sRGB emulation without restrictions, and it gives good results. I prefer using the wide gamut setting. That's because I like to explore the full capabilities of the monitor in terms of the gamut and the representation you can expect with that. And then I explore the sRGB setting separately. There's also MOBA mode, which selectively oversaturates some things. It really brings out oranges and reds and seems to completely desaturate other things. So that could be useful competitively for MOBAs, perhaps. Night vision, which gives this sort of night vision filter effect, which is interesting. I'm not sure if that's useful, but it's interesting. And then there's user mode, which like I mentioned, is similar to racing. But like racing, it doesn't apply any additional filters. You can just control everything as normal through the menu. So it's nice to have two different presets if you want to make some changes in one and then quickly switch between them. So remember I talked about the shortcut keys as well in the full OSD video I did anyway. So if you press the joystick in or press it to the left, that would get up your menu but there's a button to the left, and if you twiddle the joystick up to the right or down without entering the main menu system, you can use those shortcut keys. So for example, I could quickly change the game visual preset by just twiddling the joystick up and then selecting one of these. So far, I've shown you that I like to have the brightness set to 60 using racing mode, uniform brightness enabled. I make sure that the power saving mode is set to its normal standard setting. If you want to use VRR, then you have variable refresh rate enabled. Some people might like to use ELMB, and that's only available for 120 hertz. That's explored in the review. And you have to have variable refresh rate disabled if you want to use ELMB. So most of the rest I left at default, but color temp, I switched over to user, and I set red to 100, green to 97, and blue to 98. That got close to 6500K on my unit with a good neutral green channel, but each individual unit will vary. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, that's just to show you HDR on the monitor and go through my best settings for HDR. There's a lot less to configure under HDR. Again, you can use VRR at the same time. Brightness is set to 90 by default, 
If you go to HDR setting and then enable brightness adjustable, which is at the bottom there, I'll just adjust the camera exposure so this is a bit clearer. So yes, if you enable brightness adjustable, you can set the brightness to 100 rather than the default of 90. In doing so, there might be some minor issues with some shades being a little bit brighter than they should be, but I really did not find this obvious in the content I was viewing. I didn't find it problematic to set it to 100, and that does increase your brightness capability of the monitor. So that is what I would suggest trying. If it doesn't look right for you in some of your games, or you're just not comfortable doing it, then the default of 90 is still going to be decent, and it's still going to be pretty bright. You also want to disable uniform brightness under HDR. That will give you a lot more brightness. With that enabled, you're capped to just under 500 nits, whereas with it disabled, the monitor can go above 1000 nits quite comfortably for some content. It is a bit annoying that there's only one toggle that applies to STR and HDR for uniform brightness. It should really be something that's remembered separately. The other setting of interest here in HDR setting is gaming HDR, cinema HDR and console HDR. My preference is gaming HDR. It's a good general out-of-the-box setting really. It gives a nice dynamic HDR experience for a broad range of content using the maximum brightness capability of the monitor, so slightly over 1200 nits. It's the one that's most consistent with other standard HDR modes on monitors, so it's good for me in terms of apples to apples comparison. As always, some content provides a better HDR implementation than others, and I'd suggest making use of any in-game calibration sliders, and if you like, additional HDR calibration tools. Cinema HDR appears similar to game HDR, including on content I viewed on, on the PC using the Netflix app, although it could potentially work better for some movie content. Perhaps. I'm not entirely sure. Just perhaps. Console HDR, that definitely has its uses, that mode. It's a little bit different. It supports something called HGIG, which some PC and console games support. Generally ones that have their own little calibration slider will support this. It can improve the tone mapping accuracy based on the content itself rather than using more general so-called dynamic tone mapping data. It appears to be hard clipped to around 700 nits on this monitor. HGIG relies on HDR calibration provided by the game's HDR calibration tool or system HDR calibration data on games console or for PCs if you're using something like the Windows HDR calibration tool and you've profiled the monitor using that. People generally find that this provides a more dark biased representation of things, which some could find too dark, but on titles which implement it well, you should still get a huge amount of variety with a great array of medium shades and good highlight detail, at least up to the 700 or so nits limit I mentioned earlier. So I know that was a little bit of a long-winded explanation, but it is important to know how these differ, and again, the game HDR setting is my general recommendation, it's a good general setting. If I go to the calibration screen for Shadow of the Tomb Raider, with Game HDR for example, I can pull this all the way up, the monitor can use its maximum brightness. If I switch over to console HDR however, if you recall the accurate calibration is with a 700 nit or so limit, so HDR luminance has to be dragged right down to there, or possibly at a push there. This will depend on the game, it's not going to be about halfway for the slider on every game and some will have actual values as well. So if you're using the HDR calibration app on Windows, this is a 10% window it's showing here. You can go about to there with the console HDR setting. If I switch over to game HDR, sorry, gaming HDR, you can go further. And this is actually show values on the slider, so that according to the slider is up to around 1200 nits, whereas with console HDR, it's around 700 nits. And the same applies to full screen white, it's going to be going up to around 700 nits. That's what it's calibrated up to. And just for completeness, I'll just show you gaming HDR. Again, you can pull that further. Up to 1200 nits or so. So yes, gaming HDR and console HDR, they both have their place. Gaming HDR, I would recommend having a play with that to see how you find it. Good general setting. If you don't mind lower brightness and you want greater tone mapping accuracy on some games, that's where console HDR comes in. And the cinema HDR, I'm not entirely sure what advantages that has. I didn't notice any. It was just similar to gaming HDR most of the time. The other setting to be aware of, or settings, screen protection. So there's something enabled by default called screensaver. If you enable this, it appears to dim the edges of the screen. It kind of has this vignetting effect. It's similar to CPC, which is used on some LG OLED screens. And usually you can't disable that unless you go into the service menu. 
I find this quite annoying, this feature. So to maximise brightness and uniformity, I would recommend simply turning screensaver off. The rest, it's really according to your own preferences, or most of it is. Pixel cleaning is a cycle, and it says there when it's activated, the monitor will be unavailable for around six minutes. Would you like to activate it? Now, most OLED screens will just activate their cleaning cycle when you're not using the screen. So it's in standby or you turn it off and then automatically do it if it needs to be done in the background. I prefer that way of doing things, but Asus seems to prefer you to manually run the cycle. You can set it up with a shortcut key. So if I just press the joystick down, I can quite quickly run that cleaning cycle, but it does seem to be something you have to do manually rather than this monitor automatically doing it at a set schedule. There is a reminder feature, so that will remind you to run the cleaning pixel cycle. It'll give you a message for about, I think it's 10 seconds on the screen towards the bottom right, just to remind you. And you can set that to eight hour, four hour or two hours. Personally, I would recommend just doing this if you're not using the monitor, if you're having a meal or something and you've been using it all day, then run it. Maybe run it a couple of times a day if you're using it a lot in one particular day. I think eight hours is a fair interval, eight hours of use of the monitor, sort of running it every eight hours, cumulative use. That seems to be a decent schedule in my opinion. So it's up to you how you do it. Just be aware that once the monitor's off, so it loses signal to the system, you can't then run the cycle. So you'd need to start running the cycle before that signal is lost. There's a screen move feature, as you can see, I just left it at middle, which I believe is the default setting. I didn't find it annoying. It just occasionally nudges the image into the active area. So it's got an active area of pixels around the image, which the screen can move into. It just moves in each direction every now and then. And that just means that some of the pixels are displaying different content. It's really mainly designed to reduce image retention around edges of some objects. It's not going to affect larger static objects. So for example, if you look at this ball here, if it nudges everything just slightly, then the pixels are still going to be pretty bright and some of them are actually going to be displaying exactly the same shade anyway. So it's not exactly a magic solution. It's just one of the mitigation measures. I'd recommend just using it set to middle, see how you find it, set to strong, if you can tolerate it, light if you found middle annoying, or off if you really just found them all annoying. And there's also just logo brightness. This is designed to dim static elements of the screen. I found this dimming quite a few things which I wouldn't necessarily want it to. So it's not just logos, it will be HUD elements in games, desktop icons, even images on web pages, that kind of thing. They could be dimmed. And I didn't like this inconsistency myself, but you know, if you want that slight extra protection of this feature, then feel free to use this, see how you find it. And that really concludes the best settings.